Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to be looking at verses 1 to 16 this morning. I'm going to read that passage in a moment, but first I'm just going to give a gentle introduction to what we're going to be looking at today. This is a sermon on faith and the unseen world. What I want to talk to you about today is faith and the unseen world. One of the core tenets of Christianity is the belief in a realm that is unseen, that is spiritual, and that is eternal, that is immaterial. That is one of the core tenets of Christianity, the belief in a realm that is unseen, immaterial, and spiritual of nature. And this passage that we're looking at today from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 16, emphasizes the unseen nature, both of God's promises in that he promises things that are not yet seen and of God, because God is by nature invisible. I want you to think about that for me with a moment. Christianity is a religion of the invisible. The Christian's greatest external threat is the devil, Satan, who wields a power not of the flesh, but over flesh. We fight, as the Apostle Paul says, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of the unseen realm. Not only do we have enemies outside of us, though, do we? We have enemies inside of us. The Christian's greatest internal threat is their own invisible sin which dwells in their hearts. And Christians believe that sin is invisible and it is the invisible uh, hatred and rebellion against God that is present in every human heart by nature. The Christian's greatest internal threat is the invisible sin in their heart. The, Christian great, the Christian's greatest helper in their fight to believe in God is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is an invisible, divine person uh, who has an unseen power for good in the hearts and lives of believers. The Christian's end goal. Think about the end goal for you as a Christian. The Christian's end goal, heaven, is after all an invisible place. Not a place on earth, but a, an as yet unseen city that is to come in the new heavens and the new Earth. And finally, God is invisible, as we learn in 1 Timothy. In summarizing this theme, the tension between the visible world and the invisible world, Paul, the apostle, tells Christians that they ought to look not to things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Let me repeat that for you. We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. They change. But the things that are unseen are eternal. They are ever the same. In this passage, unseen is a synonym for invisible. But we struggle, don't we? We struggle to put our faith in the unseen things. It is far easier, we know this as Christians who struggle to believe in God, it is far easier to put your trust and your confidence in the things of this earth and the visible things that you can see. We saw in the Isaiah passage that Craig read that people want to put their trust in idols, physical things carved out of wood and stone that they can see. And we have idols in our lives as well, don't we? There are things we look to for confidence. But I want to challenge you and I want to remind you that the visible things of this world are not reliable. They change. They change. Friends, think about it, can abandon you. Your beauty will fade. Your clothes can wear out or sometimes you can outgrow your clothes. Degrees can become irrelevant as, as the technologies in the world and economies change. 
or the, the course that you trained for in a, in a trade, that can become irrelevant as AI or something like that comes along. Wealth can be lost in an instant through unemployment, through failing health, or through a series of international events that no one can possibly understand because they are so complex. And so your wealth is constantly at threat by the powers and the reality, the fact that it is visible. Health, as we all know as we grow older, is perhaps most of all fickle, and it tends to deteriorate as you age. Each of these visible things are good. They're important. You've got to have groceries if you want to eat, if you want to stay alive. Each of these visible things are good and important, and I want you to have as much of them as you need in order for you to live a quiet and peaceful life in the Lord Jesus. But these are not good places to put your hope. They are not good things to rely on because they are from the seen and visible world. In order to have reliable faith, we must put our trust in the invisible God and in his unseen promises to us into what I call the unseen world. And the very reason for this is that all visible things are transient and all and only some unseen things are eternal. In our passage today, The author of Hebrews writes about the first 18 chapters of Genesis, which are chapters that you've been studying together in your Genesis series as a church. So I've tried to only get to the point that you've actually studied through, so I don't give you any spoilers for the Genesis series. And and in that uh, passage, the author of Hebrews holds up the heroes and heroines of the first 18 chapters of Genesis as examples for the Hebrew Christians in their faith. So you can learn from Abraham, you can learn from Noah, you can learn from Enoch about how to trust in the invisible God. There are some differences, we'll explore them in our sermon. But these these people are examples to us uh, of faith. That's what they are as examples to us. And so the the author of Hebrews is writing to an audience who are in struggles. They're being persecuted for their faith. They're having struggles and they're tempted to give up on their faith. And he says to them at the end of chapter 10, you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And again, in the last verse of chapter 10, he says that we as Christians are not those who shrink back and are destroyed but we are those who have faith and persevere their souls or preserve their souls. So he's about to talk about what is saving faith. And he's going to give a definition of that by looking at the first 18 chapters of Genesis. So I think this is going to be really helpful for you as you seek to digest and put that that, uh, sermon series into practice in your life where the, the treatise on faith is actually the whole chapters of 11, chapter 11 and chapter 12 of Hebrews. It's sort of the last kind of big um, thing that the author of Hebrews wants to teach in the book. If you want to uh, you know, get extra credit, you can read those chapters with your family this afternoon or with some friends over lunch. I think that'd be a great blessing to you. Um, in order to apportion a sizable amount, we're just going to look at the first quarter of that, the first half of chapter 11. So if you're there with me in your Bibles, look now at Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to read verses 1 to 16. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the convictions of things not seen. For by it, the people of God from old receive their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, And he was not found, for God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. 
And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever who would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverential fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out from a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, ears with him of the same promise. For he was looking to a city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received the power to conceive, even though she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as innumerable as the grains of sand by the seashore. All these died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, the land of Egypt, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. My sermon on these 16 verses has three parts. Uh, The first part considers the nature of saving faith, and it offers a definition of saving faith. It looks at verses 1 to 7 from our passage. Part 2 considers the promise of saving faith, the promise of saving faith. And it looks at verses 8 to 12 of our passage. And part 3 considers the reward of saving faith the reward of saving faith, and it looks at the last four verses, verses 13 through 16 of our passage. So that's our three parts. In your bulletin, they're slightly different, so if you want to write in, uh, that's still the outline, but if you want to write in the new titles, you're welcome to also add those in as well. Let's consider that first point together, the nature of saving faith. We talked about that in verses 1 to 7. In these uh, seven verses, the author does two main things. The main thing he does is he gives a definition of saving faith. And the second main thing that he does is that he defends that definition by appealing to the heroes and heroines of the book of Genesis, which is the foundation of all of the doctrine in the Old Testament. So Paul is writing to a group of Christians and he says, I've got a definition of faith for you, and I'm going to defend it and make an argument for that from the book of Genesis in the first 18 chapters. So considering that you guys have been studying those chapters, I want you to think about, is this a good definition or not? I think that you'll find that the answer is yes. The answer is yes. This is a good definition of how all the people of God ever trusted God. We see the definition that he he wants to argue for in verse 1. He says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. That's the author's definition of saving faith. And I want to draw out two different parts of that definition uh, in this first point. First, notice that saving, saving faith has specific content. It trusts in things in this passage. So faith is the, I'm just going to read what it says. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. It trusts in things. It's not a mindless platitude. The sort of thing you might say to your neighbor if their car gets knocked over by a tree. You might say to them in that moment, well, you just have faith. It will all work out in the end, even though, you know, there's no real visible reason why they would have faith. It's not a mindless platitude that we talk about in in, uh, New Zealand and Australia when we say have faith. Nor is is it just positivity for positivity's sake. It's not just, oh, well, it's good to be positive. You know, it's good for your health. 
It's good for your psyche, helps you, you know, have confidence in life. So you, you should have some faith in your life. You should have some positive thinking in your life. It's not just a positive psychology that has no root in any specific content. Rather, faith has specific content. So that's our first point. You can see that. Look at the, uh, the sort of the, what's being said in verse 6. There are two different things that every person at the minimum must believe in order to have saving or Christian faith. He or she must believe that God exists and that God is the rewarder of those who seek him. So that's a sort of basic foundation. Everyone must believe in those two two things in order to have real and genuine Christian and saving faith. Another kind, kind of um, example of this kind of faith that believed on something specific is Abel who believed on God for righteousness. You remember the story of Cain and Abel. They both offer sacrifices. But Abel followed the example that God himself had given in the Garden of Eden in which he sacrificed an animal to provide clothing for Adam and Eve after they had sinned. Abel followed that example and he offered a pure and blameless lamb and his sacrifice because of his faith was accepted by God as righteousness. So he received righteousness on on account of that, but it wasn't because of the sacrifice. It was because of the faith. It was because he trusted in God and he followed God's example in the revelation of God that he had. It says he was commended by God as righteous. Another example is Enoch. Enoch is a curious character. He's the only person in the Bible who never died. There's only one person in the Bible who never died and was taken up to God. We read in verse 5, He was taken up so that he should not see death, as, and he was not found for God had taken him. So Enoch trusts in God that he is and that he is a rewarder. He trusts that a relationship with God is life. He trusts that walking with God is better than walking in the ways of this world, that God is the one who provides life and joy. And he finds a surprising and abundant fulfillment of that sense of trust because God actually uh, never allows him to die. He takes Enoch to be with him before he has naturally died. So because of, of this... Uh, faith is the assurance of things that are hoped for. Let's have a look at the second part of that definition. Uh, The saving faith involves believing, this is what I want to argue, believing in things that are invisible and therefore leads to hope. So verse 1 says it involves believing in things that are not seen. That's why I've entitled the message Faith in the Unseen World. That's very central to the argument that the author is giving in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. Christian faith, the type of faith that uh, is saving, involves believing in things that are invisible. And therefore, it leads to hope. As an example, look at verse 3. By faith, we understand that the universe was made by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made from things that are visible. So let's do the math together. If it was not made from things that are visible, that means it was made from things that are invisible a.k.a. it was made by the invisible God himself. The universe doesn't come from a chain of visible things stretching back into eternity where one thing creates another thing and one thing creates another thing, and you have this eternal chain of being. Instead, the invisible God made it by his word, and that is why there is something rather than nothing. Uh, the, The second example is Noah. Noah is a curious case. Uh, He believed that it was going to rain. God promised him that he was going to bring rain. He gave him a warning. There's going to be rain on the earth, and it's going to flood the earth and destroy it. But Noah had never actually seen rain in his life. Maybe it's like someone who lives in Melbourne, and they've never actually seen snow before. There had never been any rain on the earth when Noah was promised that it was going to rain. But he believed in things that are unseen. He was warned by God concerning things unseen. And Noah constructed an ark for the saving of his household. We're told that in verse 7. 
Noah's a good example because not only did he realize um, physical salvation through the flood, but he also was, he received a righteousness that comes by faith. And I want to emphasize that really clearly. These Old Testament heroes didn't earn righteousness by doing good works of faith. They had faith and they demonstrated faith. And that involved them receiving righteousness from God that is not their own. So they received a type of justification from God. They received a righteousness imputed to them by someone else. Okay, so that's our, that's our second point. Uh, this first point, I just want to put in some application from that. Let's think about, so in uh, Romans 5.5, 5, it says that hope does not disappoint for the Christian. I want to think a bit about what are we putting our hope in? So hope... Faith is under hope. So hope stands on top of faith, right? So if you have faith in the right thing, you have hope. Everyone, every one of us puts our trust in something. And I want to talk to you if you're a Christian, if you're a, a Christian here this morning, and I want to ask you, are you putting your faith in God or not? Are you putting your, your faith in God or not? Most of us have reasons for the hope that we have. We have things that we put our hope in. And we need to ask ourselves, are they good reasons or not? Have we got our hope in visible things or invisible things? How do you know the difference? I think one way you can know the difference is by, uh, by thinking about, does your hope and does your confidence fluctuate? Do you experience a cycle of excitement and then anxiety and then despair as things that you hope in and put your trust in crash? You know, putting your hope in visible things is like tying oneself down to a, a bronco at the rodeo. When I was a kid, I, we used to go with a friend to the rodeo near our house. It was one of the things I did every year with my friend Alec Prackley, my uh, best friend in primary school. And there, there would be these uh, big American bucking bulls and these bronco horses. And there would be the cowboys from all over the world. And as the cowboy was sitting in the gate before the gate was released, he would be sitting on top of the, the bronco and there'd be a little saddle there and he would tie his hand down to it. He would tie himself to it. And then once the gate was released, he would have to ride that thing. And it, by tying himself down to it, it meant that wherever the Bronco went, he went as well until the, the cowboy gave up and got too afraid, right? So if the, if the uh, Bronco bucks up, he rises with it. But if the Bronco crashes down, he crashes with it. Yeah, putting your hope or your faith in visible things is like tying oneself down to a Bronco from the rodeo. And that's fine for a rodeo, but having a rodeo is no way to live your life. If you tie yourself down to visible things, you will ride that, that um, rodeo of excitement and then anxiety and then despair as things come crashing down around you, whether that's you're putting your hope in money, in family, in clothing, in success, in your physical appearance. All of those things are visible, and that means that they fluctuate, they are transient, they change all the time. Only those things that are unseen are eternal. And so if you put your hope in God, it's a very different scenario. You're like a boat that casts its anchor to the bottom of the seafloor and beads its hope and its trust in the rock-hard confidence of the invisible God and his Christ. And so you have a steady hope. You have a sure anchor for your soul. And though the winds and the waves of life might, might seek to shake your ship, you will remain steadfast because your anchor is embedded in a rock and it's tied down to something that does not change, that does not move, that is eternal, and that is secure. A very different contrast between the rodeo of tying yourself to visible things and the anchor of tying yourself down to Christ. That's the first point, the nature of saving faith. Saving faith involves specific content and believes in things invisible and therefore leads to hope. And that definition, those two different parts, actually set up the, the next two points of our sermon. We're going to look at them a little bit more. 
And the second point, we're going to look at the promises of God. Those are the specific things that Christians believe in. And in the second and the third point, we're going to look at the reward of saving faith. That is the outcome, the assurance that's provided by things hoped for. We're going to look at those two things together. Let's have a look now at the promises of saving faith. That's in verses 8 to 12. In this series of um, verses, we see the story of the patriarch Abraham and the matriarch Sarah, who are held up as examples to us in our faith. They trust in the greatest Old Testament covenant, the covenant that God made with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. In the Abrahamic covenant, God promises four things. You might want to write these down if you're taking notes. The Abrahamic covenant promises a land, which is the land of Canaan. It promises a nation, which is the nation of Israel. It promises offspring that includes Isaac and one day Christ. And it promises a blessing to Abraham and all nations through him. Faith trusts in the promises of God. This Abrahamic covenant had at least four promises, which I just summarized. And you can see how Abraham and Sarah navigate their lives while trusting in the promises of the covenant that God had given them. Concerning the land, you can see in verses 8 and 9, I'll just read this for you. Uh, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, the promised land, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, ears together with him of the same promise concerning the land of Canaan. Second in verse 10, we are told about the promise concerning a nation. Verse 10 describes Abraham's visit to Salem. Remember, Abraham and Melchizedek were speaking together. Melchizedek was the king of Salem. And Salem was the, pro- the place that God would eventually found the city of Jerusalem. And so that's why the author of Hebrews says in verse 10 that Abraham was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose founder and builder is God. So God himself built the city of Jerusalem for the nation of Israel. Third in verses 11 and 12, we're told about the promise concerning his offspring. Sarah takes the lead role in showing us how they trusted in this promise. And we'll, you'll remember that her faith wasn't perfect at first. She had some struggles. Um, she gave her maidservant to Abraham. Uh, the maidservant had the, the son Ishmael, whom God also blessed. But he wasn't the offspring that was promised. But eventually, Sarah uh, believed in God and she trusted God. She, she would have the power to conceive even though she was past the age. That is, she had had menopause since she considered God faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. So Sarah, as a woman, her faith was crucial in the saving of the world because through her would come Isaac and through Isaac would come Jesus. And she's held up as an example of faith to all Christians because she persevered and she trusted in God's promises. And we can all learn from her as a heroine from the book of Genesis. As I mentioned earlier, though, the the new covenant flows to us, sorry, the Abrahamic covenant, its blessings flow to us through the new covenant on the basis of Christ Jesus, on the basis of his life and death and resurrection. Christ enacts a new covenant, which he tells his disciples about right before he goes to die on the cross in their place. We learn about that in Hebrews chapter eight. So let's just turn there. I want to have a quick look at a few things there. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter eight. So let's have a look at verse 6. It introduces why uh, the new covenant is better than the covenant of Moses. So it's not making a comparison between the new covenant and the covenant of Abraham. It's making a a comparison with the Mosaic covenant. Look at what it says. Christ has made and has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant that he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. 
So we also live towards God by placing our faith in his promises toward us. Abraham and Sarah trusted the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. We as Christians trust in the promises of the new covenant. Let's have a look at what some of those promises are. You can see them in the passage from Jeremiah cited in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 to 12. So God makes promises to us as Christians. If anyone is struggling with the addictive power of their sin, God promises his help to those who trust in him. And he says, I will, I will put my laws on their minds and I will write my laws upon their hearts. If anyone is struggling with the crushing guilt and weight of their sin before a holy God, God promises us his forgiveness through those that trust in him in Christ. Look at verse 12. He says, I will be merciful towards their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. And even more than that, before any of God's chosen people uh, are not even worried about their sin or its consequences, God promises to act and to give those people faith. So his elect people, God actually gives them faith. He is in and under all of their belief in God. Look at verse 11. And they shall not teach each other each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. And finally, God will take this hodgepodge of people, this licorice all sorts bag of different types of people, and he knits them together in one group of people, into one nation, into one people of God. And he says in verse 10, I will be their God and they will be my people. So that's the second point of our message today. The third point is a bit smaller, so hang in there. As I apply that second point, I want us to think about how that affects the life of HBC for you as a church and your life together. I've got two things I want to say. First of all, I want you to, what I want you to do in order to encourage each other to keep and to trust in these promises, the first thing is to show up. Why do I say show up? The reason I say show up is because by your faith in God, in showing up here, by your desire to worship him, you are showing that God has fulfilled the new covenant in your life, that you're one of his people, that he's given you faith, that you look to him, that you trust him. So I want to encourage you to show up. Just show up. I think of my home church in Dunedin. I think of when I show up to the church and I, I see Elliot there and I think, man, Elliot's like still looking for a job. And so he's got nothing to do throughout the week, but he comes here on Sunday because he looks to God and he trusts in his promises and because God has saved him. So Elliot is an encouragement to me and you guys should encourage one another by having a ministry of presence at this church. The second thing that I want to encourage you to do is simply put up with one another. Put up with one another. If you've been here since the founding of HBC, you've been here for 15 years, and there are likely people in this room that you put up with, that you constantly have to forgive, that you constantly have to overlook offenses. One of the main things that the Apostle Paul says in his letters to churches, one of the main things that he says to them, one of the main exhortations for them as churches is to bear with one another, is to forgive with one another, is to overlook one another's offenses. And you know what you do by doing that? You show that you are one people in fulfillment of the new covenant, that you are knitted together, not by your definition of the rules of rugby or football, not by the things that you have in common, your mutual love of coffee, you're knitted together by your love and allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ and your faith in him. And he takes this licorice all sorts group of people and he knits them together from all these different areas of life, from different tribes and tongues and nations, from different social situations, from different suburbs in Melbourne, from different, different ethnic backgrounds with different struggles with sin. And he brings us together and he unites us under the banner of Christ. And so if you fight with other Christians, you actually challenge the veracity of the new covenant. But if you forgive other Christians, you prove that God is fulfilling that in your life. And so I want to encourage you, put up with other Christians. Those are my two exhortations. Show up and put up. Okay. 
the reward of saving faith. That's our last point. It's going to be a little bit shorter than the other two points. We can see that in verses 13 to 16. So let's just read those together uh, um, in the the last little bit of time that we have here. It's talking about all the characters of the book, the first 18 chapters of Genesis. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had gone out from, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Do you see what's happening for the characters in the book of Genesis? They are learning by trusting in God's promises of things yet unseen that will be visible. So they see that, they trust God, they they put their faith in God, and they see the fulfillment of a promise, a partial fulfillment of that promise in visible things. But they're learning to to look beyond those visible things to that which is invisible. Look beyond the city of Jerusalem to the new Jerusalem. Look beyond the fulfillment of God's salvation for Noah. To look beyond that to to see the salvation of Jesus. They're they're looking beyond, uh, in the case of the offspring of Sarah, to look beyond Isaac and to see Jesus and all of the children who will come and be adopted into her family through Jesus. So she is learning by her faith in as yet unseen things to trust in things that are invisible. We trust in the promises of God uh, as God's covenant people. And those promises are rooted in covenants. For Abraham, they're rooted in the Abrahamic covenant. For us, they're rooted in the new covenant. But those two covenants are rooted in something even deeper, in the invisible God. And so they, these people desire not an earthly city, but a heavenly one. They're learning, they're being trained by God to put their trust in things that are spiritual, in things that are invisible, and in the invisible God himself. Think about it. Abel was promised an inheritance, and he received God's earthly commendation. But the ultimate fulfillment would have to wait for Christ, because Christ is the one who is the Son of God, who has the inheritance of God. His ultimate reward would have to wait. Noah was promised salvation for his family, and he received an earthly salvation. But his ultimate fulfillment of that promise would have to wait for a heavenly salvation through Christ. Abraham was promised many things, and he, fu- he saw a fulfillment of each one of them. He saw the eventual sight of Jerusalem, but he had begun to believe in a city whose, founders, whose founder and builder was God in the ultimate sense, in a heavenly city. You can see that in verse 16. Just read that. This is the key point of this passage. But as it is, they desire a better city that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God in keeping the new covenant. For he has prepared a city for them. We learn about that city uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, in Revelation chapter 20. I want to read you a passage from that. I think it will direct our hearts as we prepare to leave this place. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things are passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. We, like the heroes and heroines of Genesis, are on a journey. We're leaving a homeland. Abraham leaves leaves Ur of the Chaldees, and he goes to a new promised land, the land of Canaan. 
We are on a journey like that. As uh, John Bunyan says in his Pilgrim's Progress, he tells the story of Pilgrim, who is a Christian, and Pilgrim is journeying from his hometown, the city of destruction, and he's journeying towards the celestial city, and there are many obstacles on the way. He goes through many hurdles. He ends up taking a few bypaths, and he ends up always getting put back on the road by his faithful Savior who preserves his faith. And through all those hurdles, he gets to the celestial city where he gets to meet the king. And that is, was, that is worth all the hurdles and all the suffering that he went through on the way in the celestial city. My friend, your reward as a Christian is not something you're given here in this world. God doesn't promise that if you have faith in him, he will give you earthly riches or that he will give you a perfect spouse, or that he will give you a wonderful family who believe in God. He doesn't promise you that he's going to give you a wonderful house in a fantastic neighborhood. He doesn't promise you that your financial future will be safe and secure. He doesn't promise you that you will never experience illness or that no one around you will ever die. Uh, The author of Hebrews writes to the Christians in Hebrews in chapter 10, and he says um, that they are having a hard struggle with sufferings. They're joyfully accepting the plundering of their property. They're being thrown in prison, and they're being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction. That's happening uh, for the people of Hebrews. But my uh, commendation and my encouragement to you here this morning is if that's you, if you're struggling, then you haven't missed one M&M-sized morsel of your reward from God because God never promised you visible and physical things. His ultimate promises in the new covenant are promises that concern things that are eternal, that happen in the new Jerusalem. And you know, when you get there, the main thing is Jesus. The main reason that your reward is kept and is perfect and is secure and is eternal is because your main reward is the person of Jesus himself. There's the old hymn, the lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. The lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. And so, dear friend, if you are struggling in your faith and you are going through physical and visible hardships, I want to encourage you to endure. Continue in your faith because your reward is kept in heaven for you. The uh, Apostle Peter says, It is an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for us. Consequently, faith is the conviction of things unseen and the assurance of things hoped for, whether in the Old Covenant or in the New Covenant. So this was a sermon about faith and the unseen world. We considered three points. The nature of saving faith, the promises of saving faith, and the reward of saving faith. All that remains for us to do now is pray. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. Even when we are unfaithful, you remain faithful still because you are eternal and you are constant in your covenant keeping. Thank you for your faithfulness to the lives of the Old Testament saints like Abel and Enoch and Abraham and Sarah and Noah Thank you for preserving them in faith. Thank you for giving them to us as examples of those who endured hardship in the struggle to believe in your promises. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the new covenant that you have bought with your blood. Thank you that it not only gives us something to hope in, but it gives us the faith itself in which to believe in that thing. I pray for any non-Christian, anyone who's not yet a Christian here, I pray that you would give them faith as they consider your word, that they would put their trust and hope in Jesus. And I pray for each of us as Christians, Lord, would you continue us in faith? Would you persevere and preserve the faith that we have 
so that we would be faithful to the last day. In Jesus' name, amen.